1730 hours on April 4th, 2004, Sadr City of Baghdad, Iraq. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. First platoon, Charlie 25 Cav, was escorting a sewage truck in the southern part of the city. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. 17.55 hours as the sun began to set. Three large groups of men scattered to the north as the patrol approached. Everyone in the patrol began to scan their sectors. The city of over two million people grew eerily quiet. And then... What started as sporadic gunfire quickly became overwhelming from all directions. Enemy forces across the city called to arms by the echoing calls of prayer, bouncing from one minaret to the next. This sparked a chain reaction that threw the 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cav Division, headlong into the battle we now call Black Sunday. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and on this series of episodes, I will be talking to the troops who were there and their families. We will be following and discussing The Long Road Home, a seven-part miniseries in the National Geographic Channel. If you or someone you know served during the Battle of Sadr City, I want to talk to you. Join us over to our closed Facebook group, 04-04-04. Now let's meet our next guest. Yeah, yeah, I actually got to be uh, an extra. Get some tech. I gave uh, technical set expertise on the talk, uh, how it was and stuff like that and everything. So yeah, you know, every fourth we all get from a lot of us get together on the fourth at Hood to have a little mini anniversary every year, a little mini reunion. This is Specialist Stephen Ellis. He was assigned to HHC, or Headquarters Headquarters Company, 25 Kev, and worked in the 25 TOC, or Tactical Operations Center. Lancer Mike. I was the only one in the battalion, entire battalion, trained on the MCS, FBCB2, and Blue Force Tracker, which are these digital tracking systems, where you can overlay graphics and everything, and it also, you know, tracks vehicles to, to a back 10-digit grids on a and stuff. Um, you can lay overlay for missions and stuff on it. As far as my responsibilities, that was my main responsibility, but I was ours, also RTO. I was uh, uh, Battalion S3's driver. Uh, I had a lot of responsibilities. I basically hardly ever slept over there. Yeah. Mission, any mission before, after, and everything, I had to be, I was pretty much a part of it. I mean, I had one of my buddies I talked to the other day who was up in a talk, one of my close friends, um, specialist Jason Thomas, who later became officer. It's like, man, I just remember telling myself, thank God I don't have his job. <laughs> so I, I have some uh, I have some talk experience myself. Actually, my first duty station was with 4th Infantry Division on Fort Hood, and I, uh, I worked uh, at the brigade level talk. And that was back when we were fielding all of the first generation uh, FBCB2 stuff. In the 1st Brigade Combat Team, uh, 4th Infantry Division on Fort Hood as my first duty station. And uh, that was back when they uh, were doing what's called Force 21. So we had the uh, the first generation um, 
FBCB2s. And uh, it was interesting to kind of watch the, the, the progression of that technology over the years. That was back in when I joined the Army in 96, 97 uh, was when I was there. So, uh, it's, yeah, so I totally understand the, the craziness that is the talk. It can be, it, it can be the, the most boring place to be in the world, and then it can be the most lively <laughs> place. And the, and the distance or the time between it being excruciating, boring, and it completely jumping off the, the rails is it, it can happen in mere seconds. Um, talk to us about, uh, I know we were new in country at the time, um, and I know it does take a while to get a talk set up, get all the cabling run, get all the communication set, get the two five eight, you know, OE two five four antennas uh, set and and good comms established and and maps hung up and you know making sure all of the you know the alcohol markers and you know the deal, man. It's it's there's just a lot to it. Uh, logistically speaking, it's it's uh, it can be complicated and to, and to get it humming smoothly uh, takes a lot of work and finesse, but. Uh, so we weren't there very long. Uh, how? What state was the talk? Was it fully up and running operational? Or were you guys still kind of tweaking stuff? Well, it, it's kind of funny because um, we had to transition that day. And we were actually, in, when all this kicked off, we were actually in the middle of moving talks where most of our most of our guys that ride by a convoy, like on April 1st or something, I was actually flown. I was actually in Sardar City, Iraq four days earlier with uh, talk personnel prior to anybody in our else battalion showing up there. And we had set up in one of the buildings there. And when uh, we transitioned power that day, we were in the middle of set. Uh, we had to move everything from one building to our talk to where we ended up having our talk for the rest of the time we were there, which is, it was kind of ironic because it was a two story building. It was the only two story building on our fob and it was right in the middle of the fob, literally. So we were moving from a one bed, uh, like a little, I guess, conference room up to this building when this all kicked off. So no, we weren't fully operational yet. And I just left to talk when all this kicked off. My first, uh, that I guess that morning I'd left to talk. I was trying to get some sleep. And the first sign of trouble we had is that morning uh, for me was when mortars for the first time dropped on our fob. Fob War Eagle was notorious for its regular mortar attacks. Some would even joke that you could set your watch to the time of day the mortars start coming in. One of my best buddies, Jason, uh, J Jason Thomas, actually got hit by one of those. So, mm. But he was all right. He was fine. It was one of those million-dollar room wounds that hit him in the rear end, a piece of mortar shrapnel. Those, so, those uh, are the best kind, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess it was about midday or maybe that evening. I don't, I don't know. I've lost, you know, you lose track of time when you're busy doing stuff. And uh, I was walking by the aid station and I noticed we had three wounded soldiers down on the ground outside our aid station. Immediately jumped in. I was like, hey, what do y'all need? They're like, hey, we need medical supplies now. So I went around the fob collecting uh, medical supplies at first and I ended up... Um, um, helping treat soldiers that night. And you can always tell when somebody was really bad off when they brought them in because for the most part, they're sitting there. It was a small aid station. They would sit them outside on the ground and triage them out there, the IVs and everything. But then it, there'd be somebody pull up or, you know, they bring one soldier up and they'd go straight into the aid station, straight into the surgeon. And you knew that one was pretty bad. Yeah, that was, it was, we were in the middle of transition and everything. I, I wasn't even up fully operational when all this kicked off. I mean, you know, obviously, I I was there, um, in, in War Eagle. I was, uh, um, and my I was with the Brigade Reconnaissance Troop. And by the time we rolled in, uh, the sun was just starting to set, and 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 people were running out asking me for you know combat lifesaver bags. They were really hurting for medical supplies at that time. And there was, like you said, there was there was wounded out on the on the ground and. Uh, uh, just piles of gear, you know, bloody gear, you know, piles of boots, piles of OTV. And, and that was like the first, you know, time I saw that. And, and I'm familiar with the talk. I, I didn't go to the two five talk, uh, cause there was really no, no need for me to go there. But, uh, but I knew having worked in a talk before how crazy 
an environment that just must have been, you know, when all this was going down. And I have to actually thank one person. I wish I could get in contact with him again, but unfortunately he's lived up to his promise because he, he promised me one time after he's done with his military service, he was going to go back to a small patch of L.A. and never be heard from again and try to live the quiet life. And that's Specialist Boston. I was so heavily involved, and I was unaccounted for a lot that day because I was just moving from one task to another where I was needed, away from the talk actually kind of. And um, – Boston finally actually grabbed and shook me, and it's like, Ellis, you need to go to the talk. They need you up there. They've been looking for you. I will take your place here helping treat soldiers, and that's what got my attention. And uh, so uh, it was already dark outside, and I walk up to the talk, and um, uh, Lieutenant East was up there, and he saw me for the first time. And, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. The first words out of his mouth was like, Ellis, are you okay? And I just lost it. It, it just everything that I'd seen and everything. And, you know, before we left to go over there, I took the job of the talk very seriously, especially with my job, because I had a lot to do with planning future missions, current missions, and even reviewing other mission, uh, missions that had passed. So we had an FRG meeting right before we went to over there to where Colonel Valeski said that he was going to do everything in his power to bring everybody back home alive. Well, immediately that became our mission in the talk, helping him keep his word. So anytime, you know, and it's sad to say, and it, it affected me personally, um, anytime we had a soldier wounded, hurt, any of that, killed, I took it as a personal failure upon myself. Like I felt because maybe there was, I didn't, I overlooked something or maybe I missed a detail or something, something, is there anything I could have done better that that soldier would still be there, if that makes any sense. Oh, it makes it makes perfect sense, man. I think anyone that uh, served any amount of time over there uh, thought and feel felt the same way, and probably still does today. I know I do. Uh, you know, as as well trained as we were, and as 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 many things as we done right, there was a lot of things that just didn't go our way, and it's just really easy to um, ask yourselves that question. And and you know, I I call it playing the what if game, right? What if we had done this? What if we'd done that? And 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 then the other question is, did I do enough? Right? Um, did I do everything that I could do? You know, did I miss anything? Um, and, and and those are tough questions. And and the reason they're tough is because you'll never know the answer. You didn't know the answer then. You'll you you won't know the answer now. And I don't think you'll ever know the answer in the future, right? Yeah. And you know. And and unfortunately for me, it was every major mission we had. Like I mean, I'm sure you're aware. Of, Operation Iron Furies 1, 2, and 3. And also, we had an operation where we went down to Salmon Paw. Oh, yeah. Yes, my was on it. It came to getting talk personnel who was going to go out there to set up and do these missions. My name was always the first one written down because they couldn't do it without me. You know, it was funny. A year before we led up to going to Iraq, there was only three of us lower enlisted in the talk. It was me, Boston, and Thomas. And then all of a sudden, about four to six months before we got, they flooded us with personnel who basically had no idea what they were doing, learning on the fly and everything. And so it, it, to me, it, it kind of burdened being Thomas and Boston because we're having to pick up their slack because they, and it's not their fault because they, re, they were just kind of thrown into the spotlight. You know, hey, here you go, run with it. And being the only guy that was trained on those computer systems and everything, it just didn't matter. I, I got woke up all the time for missions, formed ahead of time, hey, we need you to do this, we need you to do that. And, you know, and it was to the point that, I mean, you can ask uh, First Sergeant Carson and everything that even though there's certain NCOs and officers who would disagree, I was the one that ran that talk and made it go around. And I would always cover their rear ends by fixing their mistakes when they touch something they weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You talk about the FBCB2, and, and you and I both know, maybe maybe those listening may or may not be aware, but that's essentially a, a Blue Force tracker uh, system where, you know, that's it's a digital screen. It's almost like a computer in your vehicle, and it tracks, you know, it's, uh, it's like a GPS system, but you can not only, not only see your own location, but you can see the location of everyone else around you that has these systems in their vehicle. And um, so talk to me about the, the, the vehicles that were out in Solder City, uh, the, the platoon that was pinned down and the subsequent um, 
uh, rescue sections that went out. Uh, did I mean not every vehicle had this capability, so you didn't have visibility into exactly where every vehicle was out in Sodder City, right? No, no, and you know, and these systems were still fairly new, so you know there was some, you know, I wouldn't say Valesky, but there were some lower command people who were very um, hostile towards those systems. The, the, the thing about the fourth is, is we didn't have our Bradleys up operational. And for those who don't aware, 2-5 was the first ever unit in the United States military to be issued the M2A3 Bradley. And it would never really have been tested in urban combat. And I think our unit proved that the Bradley is a very effective in urban combat. And I will stand by that. That's, that vehicle saved more soldiers' lives than I can imagine. You know, it took so many beatings and kept hitting, especially with the reactive armor. But no, not all the vehicles had it. We had a bunch, a combination of soft skin armor. It wasn't, and um, up armor, um, we didn't really have time. You got to remember for most of these people, they've only been in the sector four days. It was literally two days of, you know, right sea ride and two days of left sea ride. And oh, by the way, that night of the fourth day, here's the keys to the city. And so we didn't really have a lot of chance to set up our equipment when we got there. So the only thing we had which to move soldiers to the battlefield was LMTVs and light-skinned vehicles. Then, you know, there was – and to the credit to the mechanics, they were grabbing every slap of metal they could to try to throw onto these things, grabbing sandbags, putting sandbags up, trying to do anything to get these soldiers' protections. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough because it was a brilliantly laid ambush. You know, I honestly think they probably sat back and studied the unit before us previously for a year before they decided to go ahead and attack. So it was, it was especially it was unexpected because the last time they had contact out of Solder City or whatsoever with the unit before us previously was they had a car bomb in that previous October, and it wasn't even directed towards U.S. forces. It was directed towards the local population, and it after and that was pretty much the only incident they had the year before. Now there's some questions whether that they were actually doing their job and going into the city that came up after the fact once we came out. And actually started going in the city and trying to help the city. But, I mean, that's for other people to decide. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing, too. It's just, you know, it's it's so easy to get an opinion one way or the other when you're looking through the lens of one perspective, right? But, um, you know, at the end of the day, the only the only lens that really mattered were were the uh, the, the men and women and, and the children of the, uh, of the Iraqis themselves, right? I mean— that there was obviously enemy combatants there that wanted, uh, that were hell bent on, on causing as much uh, death and destruction as they could to the U.S. forces, uh, regardless of who they were, whether they're inbound or outbound, and uh, and I just you're right. I think I think they uh, abide their time there. The enemy is a very patient uh, individual, right? I mean, we saw that with 9/11. We saw that with, um, you know, the first uh, World Trade Center bombings. I mean. You know these these folks that are that are really hell bent on uh, on causing death and destruction. They they are a very patient patient uh, uh, group of folks, and and they they do they they spend a, a good amount of time in planning and preparation. Um, you know, there's a few people that will pick up an AK-47 and just run around like a chicken with their head cut off because it's, there's nothing better to do at the time. But you know, for, by and large, you know the, the the masterminds of these types of attacks are. They're not. They're not stupid individuals. They they definitely knew what they were doing. Uh, they had uh, a lot of numbers, and you know whether they knew that we weren't fully equipped. Uh, I I doubt they knew that you know that we left so many of our Bradleys and tanks back at Fort Hood. Um, I don't think they really cared about that. I I think once we started rolling into heavy armor, eventually I, that obviously their tactics had to change. You know. Yeah, and we were kind of set up. I think honestly for failure too on that end, but you know. We didn't – honestly, I think we should have had more time to stand up and get everything rolling just to make sure it's peaceful and stuff. But, I mean, it was it was a rough night for sure, and I'll, I'll never forget it. I mean, it still haunts my nightmares to the night. But you're talking about, you know, a, a city of two and a half million people, what was estimated what stayed in Sauter City, and almost probably 90 percent of that population was loyal to the Monty Militia. So that's what stood up against us, and that's what we were up against. You know, one lowly battalion against pretty much the two and a half million population. 
You know, we were getting shot at by the Iraqi police. We were getting shot at by that would let us help us. They were shooting at us that night. I mean, it was crazy. And you didn't know who to trust and who not to when it came out to the battlefield. Yeah. And that can cause some confusion. You know, they took over the Iraqi sticks. And, you know, and then afterwards, too, you know, it's kind of what kind of makes me upset, too, is because we were kind of marginalized after the fact, too, because the U.S. government was worried that the casualty figures that we were reporting, the American public wasn't ready for it. So we had to drastically slash the number of casualty reports when it came to enemy combatants just because of politics, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There was a lot of uh, politics involved with. Everything we did from the rules of engagement to uh, search and seizure to you know, where we patrolled, how we patrolled, uh, what we did when we were out on patrol. And and what made it even more complicated is those ROEs were, were like a revolving door. They were constantly changing every time. You know, we, we went out on the route all, you know, every day and uh, every every day before we'd roll out, uh, we'd have to stop by and essentially uh, find out what the new, what that missions or that day's uh, ROE was, and yeah, it, it made it made it very complicated to do our job. But um, I understand that that there was a lot of uh, political instability in the region. I mean, it was that time when we were uh, trying to get the first interim elections going. There was a lot of uh, uh, of stuff that was happening down down south with the uh, you know just prior to April fourth, where they had a uh, you know, strung up and killed those uh, Blackwater um, civilian contractors. And, you know, so there was a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on outside of our brigade that was uh, having an impact on uh, the temperature of of the of the folks in our region. But I mean, I have to attribute we had fortunately for us, we had great NCOs and great officers. Had we not had the leadership that we had, and, you know, we were pretty much untouched for two and a half years training together before we even went over to Iraq. So we we could tell who somebody was just by walking in the dark, just by the way they walked, and you could be from a total different company. So we were very tight. We had great leadership. We had great everything. And, it, and if it wasn't for that, I honestly think that um, we would have probably col- collapsed. You know, we probably would have folded. Yeah. But due to that, because you know, we were untested in combat when we when this happened. Oh, right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not like today. Or I say, you know, today or even five years ago, you know, um, nowadays you got people that are that are uh, deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and many of whom are already wearing a combat patch of some sort with some unit that they've gone to some deployment with. And in, and in a lot of cases, multiple deployments. Uh, uh, yeah, we were all green, everybody. Um, I think there might have been a couple of people in our brigade that might have seen Desert Storm or, you know, uh, participated in Bosnia or, or things like that. But nobody uh, saw the, the, the combat and, and the things that we were are facing when we first got there, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, we had great leaders and those who were, tra- you know, who trained well with us and you know, was everything by the book regulations with us? No, but it worked for us. You know, especially in a high combat tension, you you have to relax some of the things because you can't just keep people on edge all the time. And I think the leadership kept a great balance between, you know, discipline and relaxing some of the things to keep us, you know, give us some downtime and relax away from the hostile environment. And, and unfortunately, you know, but it still affects me to this day. I mean... I'm a paramedic now, and every time, you know, every time I look at my hands, wash my hands, I can't help but to see blood on it. If, and, you know, and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to live with it for the rest of your life. And I've had to deal with it. You know, my wife, wonderful as she could be, she's helped me deal with it. And I'm retired now because of a lot of the stuff that happened over in Sauter City and stuff. Um, so, but, I mean, I could tell you in the talk, every time somebody got hurt, every time somebody, something would happen that it wasn't a court of pain. You could hear a pin drop in that talk, and it made us all just felt a sense of failure. You know, people don't realize how stressful that job really is when it comes down to it, you know. You, you, you mentioned you were on set there uh, on Fort Hood uh, for the filming of The Long Road Home as a, as a technical advisor. 
Uh, what was that like? I mean, I know that they reconstructed the two five talk, and and the folks that I uh, that I spoke with that that actually had a chance to to go and see that said it was uh, it's a pretty good uh, replication of the actual two five talk. Yeah, I wasn't actually going to say anything or anything, but they started asking questions to uh, Top Carson, one of our former Charlie Company first sergeant, about it, and he's like, "Hey, you need to talk to man out down there. He's uh." Mr. Ellis is the one that ran that guy. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Top. Thanks for riding me out. But, you know, but I, it, it was a neat experience, you know, because, you know, the difference between Hollywood and the real thing, they want a little bit more high tech stuff. But, you know, it was actually, you know, think about it, it was very low tech. It was a lot of map boards, a lot of paper boards, markers, you know, other than the Blue Force tractor and the MCS and in uh, maps everywhere. You know, there was no real high tech stuff other than the MCS and FBCB2 stuff and the radios. So, I mean, I can't tell you what we used to keep track of everything is we had a log book on one of the MCS computers that got typed in it every day. And we had this big easel, like artist easel, where you could draw, hang that hung up. And everything, everything that happened that day would get written on that board in marker with a time stamp to it. And we'd report it up to brigade and do our combat reports off of that. It was surprise, you know, and I think they were very surprised of actually how low tech it was when it came to that stuff. So do you think that the uh, filmmakers were kind of expecting to be bringing in a lot of, you know, computers and monitors and, and replicate a talk that we would be used to seeing today? Yeah, they, they, I mean, they basically, they said they had to bring in more, you know, spice it up for Hollywood to keep people's interest. They can't just have this low tech thing that they had to spice it up a little bit, you know, and it's Hollywood understandable. Not everything's going to be 100% factual based. You know what I'm saying? You're talking about reliving events that happened, oh, God, over 10 years ago now. And from memory, recollection, and basically what would keep the audience attracted to that TV miniseries. I could tell you when I went up to the talk the night of fourth, when I finally did it, you could hardly step around in that room and breathe because there were so many officers and soldiers in that talk, uh, NCOs and stuff like that. And, you know, trying to get a clear picture of exactly what's going on, you know, only one of those LMTVs made it back to the FOB, and, and uh, the rest, you know, didn't. Yeah, do you, do you have a count of vehicles that were uh, lost to that uh, to that um, that fight? I know there were some Humvees, some LMTVs. Uh, I know uh, Bradleys and even tanks got, got hit. Do you know how many uh, vehicles? I don't think we lost Bradleys or tanks to it. Um, we only had about four Bradleys that went out that night that were ready to go or somewhat ready to go and operational. I think we sent out like four or five, maybe six Humvees, and only one of those made it back to the FOB, and it was in shambles. It was pretty much toasted. The guy came, the the soldier who came driving up in it basically drove it in, uh, drove it in on his rims to help unload soldiers. Um, you know, and another untold story of that night is of, uh, I believe it was so Staff Sergeant Owens. He stole a city bus that night and helped evacuate wounded soldiers that night on a stolen bus from downtown to help get soldiers' treatment back on the FOB. Oh, so he was out there in the bus collecting uh, casualties and driving them back to the FOB. Is that what happened? Yeah, yeah. He, I don't know how he came in possession of it or anything, but he, he found it, got it started, said load him up and under fire, drove that uh, non-armored bus, just a city bus, to the FOB to help offload wounded soldiers. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. And then I've never, uh, never heard that story. That's crazy. Yeah, and then not too long after that, he disappeared. I think he was on the verge of retirement. And uh, he, I think he was actually in line fixing to pick up his retirement papers and got a phone call. He was like second or first in line and got a phone call and said, hey, don't bother picking up your papers. Come on back. Mm. And then I think reward was he actually got to go home after that. Oh, wow. Because I never saw him on the fob after that. Um, yeah. So it was we had a, you know, and it was a little chaotic to start out at first and to talk to because we had a bunch of new personnel who hadn't been trained properly who didn't even want to be, you know, a lot of these people didn't want to be there in the first place. They wanted to be down in the line unit. They didn't understand the responsibility or the mammoth task that was before them in the talk. Right. Where most soldiers go out for their patrols, maybe do a little fighting and come back and stuff like that. We were on a rotating 12-hour uh, shift. We tried to go to um, eight-hour shifts, and it just didn't work out between the information getting lost and stuff. And then 
on top of that, for me, anytime there was any type of major mission or anything coming up on that, I would, even if I was off, I would get dragged out of my bed to go do the graphics and, you know, prep for the mission. So, I mean, I, I know when I left over there, I was about 225 when I hit boots on ground in Iraq. When I came, when I came uh, home June 28th on leave, I was down to about 155 pounds. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty pretty stressful, and and you, when it's hot when it's hot over there too, you lose lose appetite big time for sure. Yep, and I mean you know just as well as I do, they called it Camp War Eagle, but we all have a special name for it. We called it the Dirty Bird. Yeah, because I mean I <laughs> I can vividly remember I was actually talking on my phone a uh, Mother's Day with my mom on the phone, and mortar started dropping on phone uh, dropping on the fob right by the phone booth. I'm like, Mom, I got to go. And she's like, hey, what's that noise? What's that noise? To one hit a little bit closer. I'm like, I really got to go. And all of a sudden, it got hit. I mean, I could hear the shrapnel swing, whizzing by my ear and everything. Had to hang up the phone. Mom freaking out on the other end. And walk out the, the phone booth. And there's, a, and there's a, a sergeant from, I believe it was Sergeant Palacios from Charlie 182. Had got, just walked out and got hit by that mortar. Had to drop what we were doing, carry him to the aid station and get him evac'd. Hey, you know, it, it was it was nonstop with the mortars from the you know day April fourth to the time we left that fob. Yeah, so. yeah, you guys were uh, you guys were getting hit pretty hard. As a matter of fact, whenever we had to go up to uh, to Eagle, we always um, tried to plan our trip to either get there before uh, the IED started to come in or or after because it seemed like the there was like this period of time there where it was like without fail, <laughs> the the uh, the the fob was gonna get hit with something, and uh, it wasn't always like that for the but for the most part it was like pretty regular, right? Yeah, you, you could guarantee getting mortared around breakfast, lunch, and dinner on special occasions. Uh, I think it was, um, I think, a matter of fact, it was Mother's Day. We got we ended up with I think we counted over 200 mortars fell on our fob that day. Oh <laughs> wow, Mother's Day, huh? Yeah, it just seemed like every special holiday that, that we would celebrate as Americans, we got a, our, our gift from um, the Monty Militia was extra mortars on our fob. And uh, were you you were with the brigade? Were you aware of the berms north of our city or north of our fob? You mean that they existed or? Yeah, there was about six berms, about I don't know, 200 meters, 300 meters, or a half a click or something like that. That was north of our fob. Yeah. That, was favorite target for the Mighty Militia to drive up in a vehicle and drop a mortar out from it and take off before we had a chance to respond. Mm -hmm. And the, the crazy thing about those, we actually ordered the engineers in to kind of get rid of, try to get rid of those berms, and we couldn't because I think we found out those were mass grave sites. Oh, no kidding. Yes. Wow. So you went out there to you went out there to try to bulldoze them and started digging up bodies, huh? Yep. And uh, we were basically given a seat as an assist. And all that was for Saddam Hussein area. I mean, our FOB ourselves, um, our, the FOB War Eagle itself was on top of an underground prison. And when the United States invaded the second time into Iraq to push in, in initial push Iraq, it was a prison for political prisoners. That was flooded all but the top two levels with prisoners still in their cages. Oh, wow. Yes. Did you have a chance to go down there and check that out or was that off limits? Uh, only I, I've been down there several times, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, by any means allowed to interrogate prisoners or anything else like that. So it was pretty much, Hey, here, the only time we really went down there is, Hey, we got a prisoner that needs to be questioned. Here they are. Um, let's, uh, turn them over to the, you know, to the military police people or whoever they had on guard duty that day. And we left. Mm -hmm. So that, that was pretty much it. Um, uh, it was, uh, I can remember days over there to where I went 48, 72 hours straight without a sleep because we had so much going on. So what, what's the, what's a couple of things about the dirty bird that you miss? Anything? I miss my brothers. Yeah. Um, that, I, you know, the ones that not so much everybody that worked in the talk, but you know, we had Sergeant staff, Sergeant Burkholz, who's retired, just retired recently. Boston, Thomas, um, Captain East, you know, he got promoted to captain while we were over there from Lieutenant, um, Captain Shields, Major Streeter, you know, we, even the S2 guys like Captain Mendazzo and, you know, um, I forget this lower enlisted guy who ran the Raven, 
we were a tight knit group had been together for a while us original ones and so we played off each other well and we could joke with each other and stuff like that i miss that the most um it's hard to just you know to describe how much love you have for those people who are down in a battlefield with you and can understand exactly what you're going through and they they you know thomas and boston they understood what i went through personally and it, you know some people have a hard time understanding the effect that a talk can have on an individual you know i've talked about writing a book about you know my experiences in a talk yeah so so how is it what is it like to to watch the series and to see what's going on out in the city and uh, because you you experienced that from you know from the other side of the radio with those guys calling in um it must be completely surreal to have that experience and then watch the depiction in the series talk to me about that a little bit well i mean i will tell you this nobody was exempt from going out to fight in the city at one point or another we are all out there we are all having a fight the fourth kind of forced that we had mechanics out there fighting you know side by side with infantry soldiers you know and it was an amazing effort but watching it in person and everything you know i'm good buddies with a lot of these people and you know knowing what they went through especially like fisk who was you know one of the soldiers who was pinned down you know it makes my heart hurt because you know like i said it made me feel like i failed you know we had warning signs when this all kicked off because you know out of 30 40 50 translators that morning we only had four or five show up for work you know the sewage trucks wanting to leave the the um just uh the mortars dropping first thing in the morning you know it, it's all you know there was signs subtle signs and we were just trying to keep the peace and it just didn't work out you know none of us wanted to go over there and fight we all thought it was a peacekeeping mission now we were going to go up and help these people build their own country up unfortunately that's not what happened for us yeah it's a, it's it's kind of a weird thing to 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 know you know hindsight's 2020 but to look back and be able to see all those warning signs i mean it was very obvious that everyone was in on the joke but us right um, and, and I don't mean any, I don't mean any of that, uh, being funny. Uh, but, but they, they clearly knew there was something going on, uh, the local population, maybe they didn't have all the details, but they definitely, uh, they caught wind of it and, um, didn't, didn't decide to share a whole lot. That's for sure. And unfortunately for us, we took the brunt of everything because whereas why we were there, you know, and everything, whereas Fallujah and were just like one or two months assault where they went in and they withdrew. We had to stay in that city no matter what and fight in that city. So it was, I think the whole time we were over there, we maybe saw 30 days of peace. Yeah. Yeah. There was, and, there, was you know, there was no, yeah, there was no retreating back to a safe spot really anywhere. You know what I mean? Oh, I mean, you're talking about a very dense populated population who doesn't want you there, doesn't care that you're there, wants you dead. I mean, they were putting bounties on our heads, you know, and paying out bounties every time they wounded or killed a soldier. I mean, if it wasn't for the Bradleys that we had, and, you know, the tanks were awesome too, you know, uh, John Thomas, we call him Baby Tanker, you know, he, if you know, if it wasn't for the armor in that area, and and the reactive armor we would have and the leadership we would have lost a lot more and probably would have not made it through what we went through and you know all of us have after effects and we're all still finding out some stuff you know i just found out a year or two ago that we were uh that we were exposed to high levels of mercury and zinc while we were over there that's something i didn't know while we, we were that I didn't find out until a friend of mine who got out of the military later on, they slipped it in his file and he happened to discover it. And it dates back to Sauter City. This exposure Stephen talks about is a real deal and a real problem. If you've ever served, you've probably been exposed to some incredibly dangerous chemicals and elements that cause some harmful long-term effects that impact every system in your body. Jeff Adamick, retired Special Forces and host of Changing Hearts and Minds, interviewed Jeff Dardia, 
from Task Force Dagger on an episode called Overexposed. Jeff Dardia found himself starting to suffer from many of the same elements that have been affecting many veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq. He did not accept the standard answer he was receiving from many of the healthcare professionals that the military had given him. He went out and found his own answers, and what he discovered saved his life. You can listen to this episode by heading over to changeyourpov.com forward slash chm2. Where, where was the uh, where were those contaminants coming from? The the just the environment or Bob War Eagle was nasty. Yeah, nasty, very very nasty. It was it was very nasty. There, I mean, you had that underground prison that I don't even know if they ever drained it and took the bodies out of there. All this going on, and then I find out through other people who were there that we were exposed to high levels of mercury and zinc. And there's a lot of soldiers who found out who stayed in later who. You know, unfortunately for me, I was retired due to disabilities in 2006. You know, they think I fractured my back at one point over there. I got messed up shoulder, messed up knees. I've had a tumor removed. So you, you, you stay in contact with uh, a lot of the guys that you served with over there? or We have our own fa- uh, closed Facebook page and uh, that we all stay, you know, a lot of us stay in contact with and stuff. And, you know, it's funny, too, because I'll go in there and like this past Thanksgiving, I'll go in there and put like happy Thanksgiving from Lancer Mike and everybody knows me as Lancer Mike, which was our calls talk. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's funny because I mean, I ran from it for a lot of times with the guilt, and everything else. I didn't come back to the group until about two years ago when, uh, the John Thomas reached out to me. He's like, Hey brother, why don't you bring back? And it may, it forced me to face a lot of demons that I've been burying for a long time and chase it. And, you know, I still face them every day. It's kind of finally, you know, realizing what had happened and owning up to what happened, I guess you could say. And it, it hurts, you know? Yeah. Would, do you say, would you say this, uh, this series uh, has helped you with that or, or has made it worse for you? I would say probably a combination of both. I have not, wa- I have not watched all the episodes uh, I refuse to watch all the episodes by myself. I watch it with family because I don't want to be by myself to watch it. And, you know, so I make sure there's a crowd around me to support me. But, I mean, it brings back a lot of that hurt, that pain, and the, you know, tough time that we went through over there that you'll never forget. And, you know, and it also brings back the, the feeling of personal failure by not helping Valeski bring everybody back home alive. You know, I lost two close friends over there um, with uh, Hendrickson, who ran the CP for Charlie Company. And I came from Bravo Company from the talk. Uh, when I got moved from up to the talk, I got moved from Bravo Company. And there was another soldier down there who got killed by an IED, and that was Special Rivera. And, you know, and it hurt. It hurt a lot, you know, losing those two guys, especially since we were only about a month, month and a half away from leaving when those two got killed. Yeah. You know, and, you know, we were almost there. And it was about two weeks apart that we lost both of those. Mm. It brings back the memory of those guys. You know, it's like, hey, you know, these are these were two great people and they're no longer here anymore. So, you know, yeah, there was, um, I was coming back, uh, well, my section, uh, had, had the, had the pleasure of bringing guys over to buy up for the two week R and R every couple of weeks. And so I was making this trip back and forth and, uh, we were coming back from buy up uh, one day and we entered the first brigade, we entered back into the first brigade sector. And, uh, of course, you know, I've got a couple of radios in my truck, so I, switched the the brigade net from the the sector i just left back into the brigade net and uh regained contact with cowboy mike which was my cp uh talk um folks and reestablished communications with them and and as soon as i switched radios i instantly started to hear a bunch of chatter about stuff going on and i let them know that i was uh, entering the the ao i was you know coming in from the south up up uh, by cuervo uh, he- heading up northbound Pluto, and uh, and they dispatched my section. They said just continue past the FOB Iron Horse, 
and move and move up on uh, North Pluto. There's been an accident. Uh, mil- uh, U.S. convoy um, had an accident. I'm just like, okay. I'm 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 instantly thinking IED, right? We got up there and uh, we could see that there was there was uh, several vehicles around. There was there was troops out on the ground. Everybody was kind of rustling around. The, there was a convoy of uh, of two five uh, guys and um, one of the LMTVs. Um, the, 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 the lead vehicles, uh, there were several vehicles in front of the LMTV, uh, that was, it kind of kicked up some dust and you couldn't really see uh, the road very well. And the LMTV smashed right into the broad, uh, edge of a line of Jersey barriers and the LMTV flipped over. And, um, I think it was the driver that ended up getting pinned, um, underneath the LMTV. And, uh, there was a, um, uh, uh, a Mike 88 out there and was trying to to lift the the cab of the LMTV up off of him and and the soldier was still alive but he was crushed pretty good and and we were there uh, trying to just assess everything on the on the ground and trying to um, provide some assistance and security at the same time and uh, by the time we get the soldier out he was he wasn't doing well I don't even know who, who he was what his name was but uh, by the time we hey, what's that. Hendrickson. Oh, that was him. Yep. And we got him out, and we actually loaded him up into my in my Humvee, and we were about ready to head out. And right as right as we were getting ready to leave, uh, Colonel Vlesky showed up, and uh, he says, "Nope, uh, put him in my truck. This is my guy. I'm taking him." Uh, and we're like, "Roger that, sir." And so we took him out of the truck. And um, and put him in Colonel Velasquez's Humvee, and then they took off. The rest of the two five guys, they they stayed there and and and, and continued to pull security, and and they ended up riding the uh, the LMTV and and um, and going going about their their way. But um, yeah, that I remember that one. That was that was a tough one, man, um, to be there for that. Um, yeah, and you know, one of the also effects that you know weighs on you too is being up in a talk too we got to see personally the effects every time we lost a soldier we got to see the effects it had on Valesky mm-hmm. and I will know be the first one to tell you you know I, I spent six and a half years in and he was the greatest leader I ever had and you know I I went from when I, I reclassed when I left Iraq and everything to Apache crew chief because I was having a lot of injuries, a lot of pain, and I wanted to try to extend my career out to 20. I knew I couldn't do the infantry thing no more. And I sure as heck didn't want to be in the talk for the rest of my life. And I ran into the worst leadership in my career there. It's just we got to see the effects of that. And, you know, the effects of, like I said, complete failure where every time somebody got wounded, hit, or anything – over there that weighed heavy on me and weighed heavy on a lot a lot of us you know because you know any any mission or policy Bolesky put out it was our mandate to try to uphold that to the best we could and it felt to me like a personal failure like i didn't do enough to do my job and i deal with that every day every day i face that when i wake up in the morning so, you know, and I have not le- talked to Valesky since I've left 2-5. I, would, I wish I could have just sit down with him and have one more conversation because, you know, Valesky never called – unless you outranked him, he, he never called you by your rank. He never did unless it was a formal event. It was always Brother Ellis, Brother Thomas, Brother such and such. He just had a way to put a hand put a hand on you and make you feel good, but also if he needed to make you feel like you let him down all at the same time, mm-hmm. without raising his voice. So you know, I just wish I could sit down and have one more conversation with him to be able to explain to him, you know, the guilt that I have and everything. To have him put that hand on me and tell me, "Hey, it's okay." And I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does, and and I think in a lot of ways. He's really supporting this series because I think this is, in a lot of ways, kind of his way of saying to all of us, you know, we all did a good job. We all did everything we could. Um, 
uh, against insurmountable odds, right? Um, the, 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 the cards were definitely not stacked in our favor. You know, all we had to, to lean on was our training and each other and, uh, and, and our fortitude. And, and that was it, man. And, you know, we lost a lot of really good, uh, uh, folks over there that during that year, not just on April 4th, but you know, that, that whole year, you know, it was, uh, it was a rough, rough year. And that was my only deployment. But I, I talked to guys that have multiple deployments, uh, to both Iraq and Afghanistan that also served, uh, there, um, in, in OIF two part of the first brigade. And, and everyone kind of says the same thing. They're like, you know, some of the other tours that they've been on, they were rough too, but nothing like, uh, nothing like, uh, OIF two, the first brigade for sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny too, because like, I can remember this. I was going home on my R and R. You know, we're all in raggedy uniforms because we've been fighting and everything. We come pulling up at Camp Victory, where these guys have like they have to have their 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 uniforms pressed over there and everything. This sergeant, uh, I think it was a sergeant major. Don't know who he was from, what unit was or anything. And he came up and chewed was chewing our butt out about having these raggedy uniforms and everything. And this random Sergeant First Class walked up to him and was like, Sergeant Major, you need to drop your tone. He's like, who are you to tell me this? He's like, you don't want to mess with these guys. He's like, why? I was like, He's like, why not? He's like, do you see what the unit logo is on their vehicles? He's like, no. He's like, those guys are from Solder City. That's 2-5. That Sergeant Major turned ghost white. I mean, just ghost white, started backing away with his hands in the air. It's like, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm sorry. Very sorry. Y'all don't, y'all have a nice day. Sorry for bothering y'all. Took off. Never saw the guy again. <laughs> yeah, and it was, uh, and that was a funny thing. That's what I experienced too. I would tell, I'd come home and, uh, or even I would call my wife while I was over there and tell her stories. Uh, because, you know, because my section was bringing guys to buy up and picking them back up. Um, so I made that trip every couple of weeks. Uh, everybody loved, loved it when I made that trip because they'd give me a, they'd give me a list of, of stuff and, and a stack of money to go to the big PX and buy them crap. Right. But, but, uh, yeah. you, you roll, you know, we roll in there we've got our, you know, our Kevlar's, our OTVs, you know, we got the, uh, you know, the add on armor, the little, uh, shoulder sleeves and the little lat, you know, lat things in the, the nut protect there and the throat guard and like. You know, we're all decked out and, and you know, we're nasty and bloody and, you know, dried blood and sand and, and our uniforms are so salt, so salty and stiff. They can stand on their own. Right. Um, and we roll into these, you know, roll into camp victory and, uh, and you start walking around and like, everybody's just wearing, like you said, pressed uniform, like nobody's carrying a weapon. Nobody's got an OTV on, nobody's got a Kevlar. It's all just regular rolling PCs. Right. And, uh, one day we're, I told the guys we had a rotate guard, right? Cause we had all our weapons and sensitive items in the vehicle. So you know how that goes, you ro rotate guards and, and told everybody, all right, let's rot let's go to this dining facility here and rotate. Uh, we'll go grab something to eat. And we're standing in line for, for dinner chow. And I just remember, you know, we were kind of in that, in a, in the breezeway. There was like a double, double door. I think it's to kind of help keep some of the sand out of the dining facility. There's like this double double door where you walk in, it's kind of like a breezeway, and then you, I'm, we're standing in line, I'm waiting for the line to move, and I look up on, on my right, and there's this huge cork board with all kinds of like uh, bulletins and, and notices that are all push pins, you know, and it's like, you know, they they were, they had signups for, uh, signups for the volleyball team, football team, basketball team. Um, they even had uh, like a fishing tournament where they had like boats and they had rods and they were fishing out on Saddam Hussein's man-made uh, lakes there. And I was just like, I was just looking at all of this and I'm like, Jesus, I'm like, it must be nice to be uh, deployed under these conditions. You know what I mean? To to have the time to join a chess, chess club and, and, you know, there was a call of duty or whatever, like a, like a Xbox gaming club and, I was, oh, Halo. Yeah, Halo. That's what it was. That was the big one then. And I was just like looking at my guys and, you know, we're just standing there with, you know, our, our buddies, you know, dried blood on our uniforms and, and our OTVs caked in from all of the, the shit that we go through. And it's just, you know, it, it, I, I, I'll be honest with you, if, I, if we're being candid with each other right now, 
I felt a lot of anger and animosity towards those people. It wasn't their fault. I mean, they didn't choose where they deployed to, but uh, I really, I really hated them, man. I, there was a lot of anger, a lot, a lot of animosity, because if you remember, we didn't even have K, all these guys were having like KBR, Brown and Root, and all that stuff. We didn't get that till like two or three months left because our area was considered too hot for their truck drivers to drive in there. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, these guys were eating crab legs and omelets and stuff like that. And we're still eating MREs and T-rations. Yeah. And it, it, it's very frustrating, the differences and everything and how, you know, um, how we were kind of just treated like the stepchild of the Army while we were over there. Nobody wanted to talk to us. Nobody wanted to say anything to us. They all kind of ran from us. And it's like, hey, those, it's like we were jinxed almost. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Well, man, I just wanna, I just wanna say thanks. I appreciate your time. I know you're, I know you're busy. Um, so I don't, I don't wanna steal any more of your time. But I do appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story and sharing with uh, the listeners your experiences. And uh, and just know, my 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 brother, that and uh, manning a talk, it, it's it's not an easy job. Um, it, it can be one of the most difficult jobs because it's 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 critical that you're relaying communications and, and information back and forth. But at the same time, you know you, you're listening to things on the other end, and you want so badly to be there and, and to help in that capacity, uh, and you know you can't. And your in your job and your mission is there. You know, in the CP, in the talk, running running the show there. And it's I've been there, man. I know it's 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 a tough gig, um, but and it's. Definitely not not for everybody, that's for sure. Yeah, and I got one more funny story to tell you before we go. Right. Um, and it actually happens to do with Lieutenant Aquarius Platoon. And this was after, you know, the 4th and stuff like that. Um, we They were out in the city running another patrol, and they started getting fired on from a mosque. And I'll never forget this order before, but it was Captain Battle was our, our battle officer at that time in the talk. And he ordered me to tell, or told him to, t- or told me to tell him over radio, hey, tell them to take pictures of them being fired on from a mosque. And Aquero came back, and you ever know Aquero? He's not as, he can be a little bit of a smartass sometimes, and it, and that's what we loved about him. He can be quite sarcastic. He's like, and he came across the radio. It's like, let me get this straight. You want me to stick my head out of a Bradley in the middle of a firefight to take pictures? Quirrell's reaction back there, just his sarcastic tone, you know, getting, <laughs> having to try to stick his head out of a Bradley. They're in a firefight to take pictures. It just relieved some stress in the talk that day. The things you hear come across the radio can, can definitely add some levity to the situation for sure. Yeah, man. All righty. Well, y'all have a blessed night and happy holidays to you and your family. And Yes, you too, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.